It was more than a hundred years ago that Lewis Carroll wrote about Alice's trip through the looking glass. Now that fiction has become a reality, or you might say a virtual reality, because that's the name of a new computer technology that many believe will revolutionize the way we live. The doors are opening on a world where the line between reality and illusion has dissolved. Advances in computer graphics over the past 10 years are making it possible to create artificial three-dimensional worlds, complete and convincing, though they only exist in the mind of the viewer and the heart of the computer. Known as virtual reality, or VR, this new technology uses pictures and sounds to wrap around your senses. Imagine a place, and you'll be able to step into it. It's unreal. It's different. And it's so natural that when you experience it, it's something that, uh, you know, people come out of the system and say, wow, that's unreal. <sighs> that's unreal. <laughs> Let us return now to the Alex Vance. You know, I'm just realizing that we've been trying out this whole virtual reality thing with video games for about as long as there have been video games. I mean, if you wanted to get all technical on me, you could amend that statement by saying the concept of VR itself predates any kind of modern gaming, with advancements in the technology being toyed around with as early as the late 60s. But if you knew all that, I'd have to call you a bit of a dweeb, wouldn't I? <laughs> and uh, it's my show, Poindexter, so keep your hand down. Guess we've just always been fascinated by being able to experience a completely manufactured reality within our own by simply putting on a pair of goggles and looking around the room all mouth agape like simpletons. It was one of those science fiction concepts that was conceivably within our reach to achieve. Though it could be said that we were maybe a bit too eager to achieve it before the technology was fully there to back it up. Attempts like Nintendo's Virtual Boy would try ever so desperately to invoke that feeling of entering the game, quote unquote, just to experience brutal failure from being a bit too ambitious without having much to show for it. Other than the second mortgage you'd need to take out not only to be able to afford the thing, but the necessary corrective eye surgeries as well. Oh, don't worry, Virtual Boy, I'm sure no one's thought of mocking you yet. It wouldn't be until decades later that virtual reality as we know it today would finally start gaining traction. PC gaming was becoming many people's option of choice who were able to afford it. And with the technology upgrading quickly, it was time to take another swing at the possibility of a commercially available virtual reality machine. Our intelligence as a species had evolved. After a hugely successful Kickstarter campaign, the Oculus Rift prototype would become the trailblazer for VR gaming, seeming to actually achieve an elusive sense of immersion that people could only dream of experiencing before. It was like really being in the game. The next big step forward within the medium was upon us, and everyone who saw it in action couldn't wait to try it out for themselves. Once developers could start getting their hands on the tech, a flood of unique games began popping up, all made to be exclusively played in VR. Games like Superhot and Beat Saber would be must-have titles to experience the fast-paced and more arcade-style excitement that complemented the hardware well. It was all good fun, though for a while it didn't get much more interesting than that. People were a bit unsure on what would and wouldn't work for audiences in VR. Some companies would just dip their toes in by making a relatively bite-sized spin-off title for an existing IP to gauge reactions, while others would explore different social experiences with games like VRChat, allowing you to pick your own custom avatar and hang out with some like-minded freaks of nature. I feel the less I delve into this one, the better. And may I mention the bevy of barely functional novelty shovelware games that only seemed interested in having you do a single task in a silly way, and that's about it. Outside of these more casual gaming experiences, people were starting to wonder what else would be coming down the pike to justify that heavy price tag for getting to actually use one of these babies. I guess you could hang out in one of these showcase environments, maybe do some 3D drawing, or watch some of your favorite YouTube videos in the VR video player. No, no, wait, 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 hold on. This is my favorite part, watch this. Resulting in the video game mascot equivalent of that one drunk guy at the party wearing a Hawaiian shirt and thinking putting a lampshade on his head is still a wild and crazy idea anytime after 1982. <laughs> oh, God, I'm good. You see, you're learning and you're laughing. I, I think people don't talk about that enough. This isn't 
isn't to say there was nothing coming out for VR. There was a steady flow of unique titles worth trying out. But at the same time, there was also a looming sense that maybe virtual reality gaming was starting to plateau, and could ultimately risk bleeding its already modest install base if no games were planned to really push the tech forward in terms of not only visual fidelity, but game structure as well. Who could save this slowly decaying style of gaming from becoming nothing more than just an expensive gimmick? Who would be our savior? Well, you always seem to find what you need in the last place you'd ever think to look. Valve, of all companies, would be the ones to come out of the woodwork and shock everyone with their announcement of Half-Life Alex. Not only would they be ending their dry spell of little to no game releases since their shift in focus to hardware, maintaining Steam, and card games that... I, I, I mean, did, did anybody play this? But they'd also be making their long-awaited return to the beloved Half-Life series after 13 long years. Oh, I'm sure those Half-Life fans out there barely even noticed it took any time at all. This was it. This was the title that was going to pave the way for everyone else and set the standard for VR gaming. In fact, there was no way the announcement of this game wasn't going to blow everyone's minds in late 2019. Sure, Valve had just released their own VR headset and controllers a few months prior, but a new, single-player, fully virtual reality, story-driven Half-Life game developed in-house by Valve? I mean, I, I know I'm being redundant here, but I really can't stress enough just how unexpected and exciting this announcement really was. I'm a pretty casual Half-Life fan myself, and even I knew I had to save up just to get to play this. The 2020 release date couldn't come fast enough, and would go on to be... Okay, maybe not the most talked about subject of that year, but, but still pretty high up there. But here we are now four years later. The game's made its splash and has been experienced by many, including myself back in 2020. But I've got to be honest, outside of showing it to a few friends, I never really felt inspired to go back and play through this whole game again after the first time. Well, that can't be right. I remember really being blown away by this game. How could I have not touched it in years? Regardless of the whys, I figured four years has been enough time for me to start a fresh playthrough and see if my thoughts have changed on the game, and to look a little more deeply into what it's done for the world of virtual reality gaming as a whole now that it's had time to leave an impact. After four years, it's time to suit up for another trek through the innovative VR adventure, Half-Life Alex. Right after this part, hold on. And as a result, became nothing really worth talking about. However, Oh, oh, my mistake. That's actually the end of that sentence. <laughs> God, keep it up, kid. You are going to change the world, and I'm not even kidding when I say that. It's been a good few years since the last Half-Life, so somewhat understandably, Valve played it a bit safe when it came to the story for Alex. Along with some other aspects of the game, we'll get into in due time. It's a prequel, set five years before the events of Half-Life 2. We're playing as a young Alex Vance, who we know will later go on to fight alongside Gordon Freeman against Earth's alien occupying force known as the Combine. Though here, Alex is still a spirited resistance member, working with her father Eli to, in any way they can, fight the Combine's destructive police state imposed on the now crippled planet. Unfortunately for Alex, her father wouldn't be long for the fight, as he ends up getting captured by the Combine forces and taken off as prisoner to be interrogated and likely killed. It's now up to Alex and Russell, a tech-savvy Resistance member who maintains constant contact with you via your in-game earpiece, to save Eli and stick it to the Combine while they're at it. Eventually, the duo end up rescuing Eli with help from a friendly Vortigaunt, a member of another alien species occupying Earth that are actually allied with the human race. I'm trying to find a more savory way of saying they're one of the good ones. Here. Sustenance. I'll eat it later. Thanks for the help. You will be welcome. Briefly reunited with Alex before needing to split up again, Eli warns her that the Combine have some kind of giant super weapon within a vault that needs to be either stopped or stolen before it's too late. With her new mission directives, Alex heads to the quarantine zone, again, yeah, that word was getting a lot of mileage at the time, to break into the giant floating vault and shut down what lies within. As she approaches, Eli and Russell find out that the vault isn't actually housing a superweapon, but rather a prison containing something the Combine deemed to be incredibly powerful. The team decide, well, we've already come all this way for God's sake, might as well keep going and attempt to break out whoever's in there, assuming that if it's bad for the Combine, it's good for them. The idea gets pitched by the Brain Trust that it must be the legendary Gordon Freeman that's being kept within the prison, held there since his disappearance after the whole Black Mesa affair in Half-Life 1. 
After some more friendly Vortigaunts help sever the connection cables and Alex herself crashes the vault into the ground, she breaks in and takes out the patrolling Combine forces to finally release the captive prisoner, discovering all too late that it isn't Gordon Freeman. Gordon Freeman? <laughs> Miss Vance, you wouldn't need all that to imprison Gordon Freeman. Turns out, it was the mysterious G-Man who was being held within the prison. An unsettling figure who serves as a connective thread through all the Half-Life games, and whose origin is never explained. However, it's understood that the G-Man possesses tremendous power, and is capable of influencing important events when his faceless employers deem it appropriate. After denying Alex's request to remove the Combine from Earth, G-Man repays her in another way by allowing her to save her father from eventually being killed years down the line during what turns out to be the ending of Half-Life 2 Episode 2. After Alex does the dirty deed and changes the course of events forever, the G-Man acknowledges her capabilities in getting herself this far, and ultimately decides to suspend her in an indefinite stasis, to where she'll be forced to await further assignments from him. The credits roll on this somber note until the post credit scene puts the player in the point of view of Gordon Freeman once again, to briefly return where they left off at the end of Episode 2. Though now, instead of being a dead guy, Eli is A-OK, -okay, though justifiably steamed that his daughter has been, for all purposes, taken prisoner by some nicely dressed space deity, leaving us on a cliffhanger for the series once again. Like I said, this story is relatively safe in terms of taking many narrative liberties with what the series had set up. That is, until the very end, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The plot was always something that was very easy to gloss over in these games if you just wanted to keep things moving and go shoot some more cool guns. More specifically for Alex, there was the added weight of needing to allow players to get used to their surroundings and the intricacies of virtual reality gaming before being able to dump a bunch of story information on them. Because of that, a lot of the world building is done through visuals alone, letting you soak in these environments and take as long as you want to just sift through all the tiny details they sprinkled all over. It was pretty impressive to see all this in motion, and I think my reaction speaks for itself. Wow. Though I wasn't always wowed by the dialogue, mostly between Alex and Russell. Half-Life isn't all violence and drama, there's also some light comedic and over-the-top moments to bring some much-needed levity, generally injected via the memorable cast of characters you'd run into throughout the course of the games. There's a stark difference in the amount of NPC interactions there are in Alex compared to before, to the point where talking to Russell over the earpiece about whatever it is you may currently be interacting with serves as a good 80% of all verbal interactions. I get it. Pushing for a further sense of isolation than what was explored before helps accentuate the player's immersion within VR, and that sweet feeling of genuine fear one might get while exploring the more, shall we say, dimly lit environments. From a design standpoint, I can see why they might have trimmed the cast down for this caper. That and, uh, uh, yes, Alex can actually talk. While playing as the famously mute protagonist Gordon Freeman in the original games, a lot of the story's heavy lifting needed to be done by those around you, incentivizing having a more populated world to not only lend to the stakes of the plot, but to keep the player naturally directed on where they should be going next. Since Alex was originally introduced in Half-Life 2 as being blessed with the elusive power of speech, they certainly couldn't take that away now just for the sake of tradition. I want to make the distinction that I don't dislike that the game is mostly Alex and Russell talking to each other. I dislike how Alex and Russell mostly talk to each other. Four years ago, I would have told you I enjoyed the littering of ironic, quippy one-liners that both characters would dispense in response to what they're seeing. But I think with time, this type of writing is really starting to not age the best. You know, Russell, now that I'm walking into the quarantine zone, it just hit me. I don't know anything about the quarantine zone. Well, actually, the word quarantine comes from the Italian quaranta giorni, uh, which means 40 days, the period that all ships were required to be isolated before crew could go ashore during the Black Death. All right. Cool. Granted, this isn't the first time Valve characters were slanted more comedic in their delivery, and this is more of a personal nitpick, if I'm honest, since it's only really an occasional thing I noticed. Most of the time, their exchanges are perfectly fine. But everything talks like this now in media. From movies to games, there's a never-ending flow of satiric, detached characters making their Wow, that just happened! witticisms and a plea to the audience to find them in any way relatable. Okay, I know, I know, a another crotchety online killjoy is complaining about the Whedonification of modern writing. You can go ahead and mark that off your bingo card now if you're playing along. 
Other than in these moments, I did find myself enjoying the characterization and the built-up mystery surrounding what was truly waiting within the vault. The ending, however, well, it's funny, because while I think I've gotten less lenient on the writing as a whole since my first playthrough, it's kind of the opposite when it comes to how it all wraps up. I was left pretty disenchanted the first go-around to see time travel being thrown into the mix, which is a nearly impossible plot device to work with outside of stories that are doing it more tongue-in-cheek with a comedic twist. Let's not push for more of that, please. The overall timeline was now much more difficult to follow. If Alex, in fact, saves her dad from dying in the future and then is put into stasis, how does she go on to play a part in the events that unfold five years down the line, leading to Eli being in that lethal position to begin with? Within this game, taking place in the past, we're affecting the future, which is technically the player's past as we've seen these things happen already. But now they're permanently rewritten to happen this new way due to the actions of a character five years before they even started. Yeah, it's a mess. But you know what? I find it a bit more easy to digest after taking a few more aspects into consideration. The original writers for the Half-Life series have since left the company before this game was conceptualized, and one of the final nails in the coffin for those hoping all this time to see a Half-Life 3 would come in the form of a plot summary posted by one of these former Valve writers, Mark Laidlaw, on his blog. The post, using fake code names for the characters, would outline the entire story of what was deduced to be the unreleased Half-Life 3. With all this now out in the open, fans assumed the project was permanently dead and buried. That is, until Alex came along and said, Nope, we're back with a prequel story and an ending that retcons all of those events to essentially wipe the slate clean for the future. Meaning now, Valve can steer this ship in whatever direction they see fit. While I don't necessarily care for time travel being used as a plot device here, I do recognize that this must have been kind of a tight corner to write themselves out of, and I won't pretend like I would have had a better idea on how to handle it. For the purposes of someday getting to see that next Half-Life game, I'm just going to roll with it. Turns out I'm going to end up having a bit of a writing challenge of my own while talking about the gameplay, because how am I not going to end up overusing the word atmosphere? Like I said before, every environment you come across is painstakingly drenched in a level of detail I find to be nearly unbelievable. I think it also helps that I don't play VR games very often, so I'm still not fully used to how engrossing it all feels to really be inside a game like this. From the very first moment you boot up a new save file, they knew they were here to impress, letting you look out to a high up view of City 17. It's not tremendously original with its locales all the way through, tiptoeing a bit into that safe category again. A lot of the places on your journey are of the Half-Life 2 variety. City streets, tunnels, abandoned buildings. If you played a Half-Life game, you've already seen these places. Though, the occasional alien-infested hotel or zoo do well enough to keep it from feeling too identical to what came before. A detail I personally enjoyed was watching how the sun would continuously go down throughout your adventure, starting you in the morning and wrapping things up at night, adding a more distinct mood to each landmark you visit. Speaking of details, you can mess with nearly any object you're surrounded by, and there's tons of secrets to uncover if you're curious enough. I'd sometimes find myself copping a squad and staying in one place for a few extra minutes just to mess around with whatever I could and take in the setting. It's very easy to sink time into admiring how this game looks when you stop and smell the roses, and this level of interactivity doesn't slow down throughout the entire game, giving you ample opportunities to goof off and personalize your experience however you want. That personalization is thankfully extended into the controls as well, with there being a nice amount of customization options for different playstyles, everything from switching up your dominant hand to how you move around altogether. You may have noticed in this gameplay the screen briefly cuts to black when I move around, as opposed to a more continuous movement. I chose to go for what's called the blink style of traversal that lets you select a spot on the ground and teleport to it with a brief black screen in between because, well, I guess this is as good a time as any to mention this, VR gaming makes me sick. I know, what the hell am I making a video about it for then? Well, the thing is, this game puts me in the extremely unique position of really enjoying what I'm playing, despite the fact that it makes me physically ill to play it. Can't say that I've come across this before. It's the motion sickness that gets me. Having a screen less than an inch from my retinas tends to do that. So the idea of skating and swaying the camera around in one continuous movement? Ugh, there's no thank you. I'll take the blink for my own well-being, even if it's only partially helpful. Now, am I trying to be seen as some kind of martyr for going through all this discomfort just to make a video for people? Yes! Aspen can get expensive, I'll have you know. It's not all fun over here, gang. Visuals aside, the unsung hero of Alex definitely has to be the sound design. 
Longtime series composer Kelly Bailey would not be returning to do the soundtrack. It was Mike Moraski who would take the reins this time around and do, I think, a very great job at matching the Half-Life style. Moraski would consult with Bailey throughout working on the project, and the outcome would be a strong techno-industrial sound that consistently suits every scenario. From the fast-paced action sequences to the sudden horror stings to keep you on your toes, and that's all without mentioning the stellar ambience achieved through just the sounds of the world. I must say though, one of this game's goals is to scare you alright, so it needs plenty of threats with which to properly do so. While the variety might have taken a slight step back, how these threats are utilized certainly makes up for it. We've got the old favorites like regular zombies and head crabs, with the latter coming in a few different variants. No fast zombies though, I can only imagine how scary something going at that speed would feel coming at you in VR. I think the head crabs jumping straight for your face do the trick just fine. There's also barnacles, which are absolutely everywhere in this game. Those creepy alien mouths that are stuck to ceilings and catch their prey with their long hanging tongues. Most of the time these are pretty easy to just walk past, but where's the fun in that? Go ahead, chuck some explosives in their mouths, live a little. Or let those head crabs just jump in themselves and kill two birds with one stone. Antlions also make their return near the tail end of the game. For how late these guys show up, they are a little on the easy side to take out once you know how. Shoot one leg, shoot another leg, then shoot the giant glowing abdomen once it's exposed. Yeah, pretty simple, but honestly I still loved fighting these things anyway. It's that sound design again. They have such a satisfying crunch when you shoot them that's just music to my ears. However, these blue variants can go f*** themselves. They shoot out this acid that completely blinds you if you get hit, and it's so bright, making it very easy to get disoriented and unable to find cover to avoid getting hit again, and it's just obnoxious. But not quite as bad as these little guys, confusingly referred to by Alex as lightning dogs. I guess it's just a part of her character that she refers to things as dogs that look nothing like dogs. Fighting them on their own is fine enough, though it feels like they take a lot of bullets before going down and make you do quite a bit of running around to keep up with them. It's more so when they possess bodies of zombies that taking them out feels like a chore. It's a cool idea, but all it ultimately means in combat is that they now do this long telegraphed electricity move and need to be shot in their big glowing sacks a few times for the lightning dog to get spat out again. It turns into a waiting game, becoming a real pace breaker when fighting multiple of them, and the moment just doesn't have the same impact when you have to sit through it a fourth or fifth time in a row. Luckily, these only pop up a handful of times in one chapter of the game, it just makes for one of the weaker points. Though I have nothing bad to say about any time you fight the Combine, these sections are handled in a more traditional way. They've got guns, you've got guns, and you can both use the environment to your advantage. Ducking for cover and taking shots when you can in these fights was incredibly invigorating. They were some of my favorite parts of the game, making the player have to really think quickly on their feet. I'm only somewhat embarrassed to say how into these moments I got. It's just so much fun needing to really physically duck down and peek around corners to strategize your approach to the daunting rain of bullets coming your way. I really like that the game rewards you for thinking outside the box too, like allowing you to do some sneak attacks or even letting you hurl incoming combine grenades right back at them. I honestly would have been fine with a couple more of these sections thrown in the game, but I'm also glad they didn't overstay their welcome. In fact, the game's overall pacing and sense of progression is pretty immaculate. For every heart-pumping gunfight, there's an equal amount of more exploration-focused sections. Whether you're hunting for the path forward, or for hidden goodies in every cabinet, drawer, or washing machine you can find, aiding in your search is what's referred to by Russell as the Russells, these electronic extensions to Alex's hands that allow you to simply reach out to any faraway item and flick your hand back to yoink it from wherever it was right over to you. This is by far the most useful tool in the game, in lieu of actually making the player need to physically walk over to grab everything they see, which would have gotten real cumbersome real fast, especially when things get a little jittery when it comes to collision detection as it is. The Russells also work as a quick heads up display to show you how much health and ammo you currently have and even give you single item inventory pockets on each hand to store anything you want for later use. Just don't ask me how it works. What you're using the Russells to search every nook and cranny for are all things that aid in your survivability. Mostly you'll be finding various ammo clips for your weapons, the pistol, shotgun, and SMG, though you can also find resin, which I'll explain in a minute, and occasionally even some syringes filled with some kind of substance that you can poke yourself with to quickly heal. Though I found my results varied a bit on the game actually understanding that that's what I was trying to do with it. 
If you're not using the syringes, though, you can find these glass canisters that house a little alien creature you plug into a wall unit and crush to death so you can use the juices that burst out to heal yourself. Okay, I know I'm sounding insane right now, but that's really what happens in the game. Please don't send help. I am of a sound body and mind. Things like the ammo and resin are super intuitive to put away, too. Whenever you find either, all you need to do is reach back behind your head to simulate putting it away in a backpack. Same goes for when you need to reload as well. Just reach back and you'll grab another clip for whatever weapon you're currently using, as long as you still have enough. It's pretty admirable how clean of a gameplay flow they were able to achieve without any menus or button presses, outside of the weapon selection wheel itself, which is also pretty quick. Oh, and you heard me right before. There's only three main weapons you can find throughout the entire game. I can see how that may have been disappointing to longtime fans, being a direct downgrade to the consistently growing arsenal of yesteryear. There's not even a designated melee weapon, a longtime staple. Apparently, the developers ran into a lot of issues trying to get one to work in this engine, and after seeing how janky the game can sometimes get, maybe we're better off without it. Instead of the progression being tied with giving you brand new guns all the time, things are a bit modernized by allowing you to spend all that resin you've been finding on upgrading the weapons you have at the terminals. These upgrades can get pretty hefty in price, so it's likely you won't end up getting every single one for each gun, but that's okay since there are certainly some you can go without. The essentials are definitely the laser sights for each. Depth perception isn't always your friend in VR, so anything that can assist with proper aiming is a godsend. And while I do really like how reloading each gun is unique and satisfying, clip upgrades and auto reloads are terrific at letting you keep on the offense for longer. Though I'd avoid ever getting the reflex sight for any gun. Your resin is better spent on anything else. It's meant to give you a tactical view of where your target's weak point is, but it's always the head. Just shoot the heads. And then get the laser sight to assist with shooting the heads. Problem solved. I admit though, I slept on the grenade launcher upgrade for the shotgun in my first playthrough way back. I don't think I ever had enough resin to buy it at all. Though this time, I was able to purchase it near the end of the game, and man, I should have saved up for it sooner. This thing is great at letting you throw around some controlled explosions for your everyday use. Since it can be a bit awkward to aim grenade tosses by hand, this makes a world of difference. But perhaps the most polarizing tool at your disposal isn't a weapon at all. It's Alex's multi-tool she can use for more puzzle-centric sections of the game. This is mostly useful to follow and reroute a power source to something you need turned on, or to activate those aforementioned weapon terminals and some item stashes you can find. It's okay, if not a bit repetitive. I mean, I think they make you do this orb one like 20 times in a row. It's just, I prefer my puzzles to be a bit more tangible, I guess would be the word. If I meant to do or find something, I'd rather the solution feel more natural to my surroundings instead of just messing around with a colorful little hologram to make a door open or something. There are a few moments in the game where you need to actually search or manipulate the environment in a clever way to progress, and they're rewarding to solve. However, it's the multi-tool that's used the most for any brain scratchers, making it feel like maybe there's a bit too much reliance on it as a catch-all problem solver. I think this game is at its best when it's expecting the player to figure something out without directly holding their hand. Cleverly placed breadcrumbs to spark your intrigue and make you ask, I wonder what happens if I do this, almost always lead to an interesting result. And nowhere else is this design philosophy greater realized than in this game's seventh chapter, simply titled Jeff. Oh yeah, if you've heard anyone talk about this game, you've probably heard them mention this chapter specifically as the highlight, and for good reason. If I had to describe this part of the game in a single word, it would be tense. If I had to describe it with a single sound, it would be... So what's all the hubbub about? Well, quite simply, it comes down to a well-realized idea being fleshed out using the in-game mechanics you've come to understand in a completely new way. This giant mutated creature, simply referred to as Jeff, wanders the halls of an abandoned vodka distillery that you need to get through. After meeting one of the game's rare NPCs named Larry, he explains to Alex that Jeff can't actually see anything. He's 100% blind. However, he does have a heightened sense of hearing and is dead set on destroying any living creature he comes across. Being surrounded by loud, breakable vodka bottles, I'm sure you're starting to piece together how this might play out. Distract the beast by making sound in one area so you can sneak past him. Easy, right? Nothing too overly complex, which is why I think they were able to put all their effort into making this whole section one white-knuckle moment after another. There's nowhere you can go within the distillery that this guy won't be able to follow. And there's plenty of troll moments the game teases you with where you think you might have gotten away, but oops, some glass bottles fell right next to you. Better find a place to hide because he's racing towards your exact position and can easily rip you apart. 
Every time you think you have the upper hand over Jeff, you're brought back down to the crushing reality that it's not going to be that simple. Hey, good job! You just locked him in a room where he can't get out. Too bad just a few moments later, you're going to realize you need to get into that room in order to mess with the wiring and progress. I'm sure Jeff isn't still mad about being locked- OH GOD NO 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 There is such good cinematic tension building done here without ever taking control away from the player. My favorite part being when you're stuck in this freight elevator with him and are forced to keep your hand cuffed over your mouth to avoid breathing in his toxic gas that the game teaches you earlier will involuntarily make Alex cough. In order to get the elevator to move, you have to sneak up inches from Jeff to hit a button, which is stressful enough, but right after, the game reminds you why you shouldn't get too cocky after a head crab sneaks its way into the elevator and promptly gets a patented Jeff greeting while you sit and watch terrified that that could have just as easily have been you. This was easily my favorite part of the game. Every aspect of Alex that I adore was in full effect here. From the gripping sound design to fast-paced puzzle solving, it was all in service to making the player feel like they have genuine agency over how they combat this creature, and that their situation couldn't be worse. It wasn't until I got through this section that I realized I didn't even need to fire a single gun the entire time I was in there. This chapter's length is perfect, exploring everything they can do with the concept without repeating any tricks all culminating in a terrific finale where you get to triumph over Jeff once and for all by leading him into a trash compactor and putting him out of his misery. Though not without one last gotcha moment, the game totally called me out for gawking at the viscera left behind and puffed out one last bit of gas as if to say, hey don't act so tough kid, we saw how scared you were. I remember this chapter standing out to me four years ago and I'm going to remember it standing out to me for years to come. It's a prime reason why this game is as fantastic as it is. And while I do think it's the peak of the overall experience, it's not to say there's nothing else afterwards that's interesting. This later fight with a strider is pretty exhilarating as you avoid its sightlines and eventually get rewarded by firing into it with a blast turret. And after finally getting into the vault itself, the trippy and otherworldly visuals do a great job at reminding you that you're no longer in a place you're likely to come back from. When the game equips you with these gravity gloves near the end that just mow down enemies, the sense of power is terrific. To the point where I don't even notice that it is a bit derivative of Half-Life 2's gravity gun upgrade near the end of that game. Eh, it's different enough and only really lasts for a few minutes anyway before the game ends. Without gushing too much about every individual part I found engrossing, I think that's as good a place as any to start summing things up. This'll last you about 10-12 to 12 hours your first playthrough, and I think that's a pretty good length for this. Though, by the end, I did feel a bit exhausted, and not just because of the migraines. So if you ever plan on playing this yourself, make sure you take a good amount of breaks. The game throws a lot at you in a relatively short amount of time. Warts and all, though, this is clearly a VR system seller. It's the reason I have one, and it's available for all modern VR devices, too. If you have one of those and haven't played this game yet, well, what are you doing? Too busy playing that Wallace and Gromit game? Half-Life Alex managed to do two nearly impossible things at the same time. One, be a worthwhile addition to a series that has had so much buildup over the years the developers were petrified to even touch it. And two, be a catalyst for an uptick in quality for virtual reality gaming altogether. Nothing looked like this, or played like this before. Alex is a completely unique gaming experience unto itself. And if you're someone who has any passing interest in seeing what it's all about, you owe it to yourself to give it a shot. If the money's right, uh, yeah, I guess it's time to start talking about the negatives here. Look, not everyone was thrilled to see that while Half-Life was finally coming back, it was for VR users only. Meaning, you could be the biggest Half-Life fan in the world, but if you don't have the thousand dollars plus to drop on everything you need to play this, you're gonna miss out. It's clear why that sucks for people and could really shed a dismal light on this title as a whole. But I also don't think it would be entirely fair to ignore how groundbreaking this game is solely on those grounds. When the first Half-Life came out in 1998, not that many people had PCs they could play it. They just weren't as commonplace back then. However, those who did touted it as one of the most influential gaming releases of all time, 
justifiably so, for how much it did to push the genre forward and help boost attention on a more niche area of the medium. You could argue that PC gaming was bound to catch fire regardless of Half-Life, and I'm sure you'd be right. But I truly don't think we would have seen as many great games as we did for PC without Valve's landmark title. Alex, in a way, is doing the exact same thing in a modern era. It's, once again, setting a bar for a more niche area of the medium, just like the series did from the start. Though unfortunately four years out, we're just not seeing the effects of that raised bar like we might have hoped we would. I can't think of one major VR release since Alex that really turned people's heads, and I wish that wasn't the case. There is so much here that could be built off of, or reworked for a different purpose, and I know there's people out there who are trying, but the general public just doesn't seem very interested anymore. No other major companies are really taking risks by doing AAA releases exclusive to VR, despite seeing the positive critical reception Alex got. It's just much more financially viable to put all that effort into a release that can be played by a much larger audience. As for Valve, it's been radio silence from them on any kind of follow-up, virtual reality or not. I do wish everyone who wanted to play this game could play it, but that's the unfortunate nature of VR. Not everyone can afford it, has room to use it, or can justify buying it at all. Though it feels like it's been around for a while now, virtual reality still has a lot of growing to do. These days, most new advancements in the hardware are tailored more towards augmented reality purposes, which has its own sets of pros and cons, with people either all for it as the next logical step in technology integration within our culture, or deeming it as a creepily detached and dystopian step in the wrong direction. It's an intriguing discussion. One I hope you're not looking for a hot take on from me. I'm still a guy who can't decide what color looks best on Putt-Putt. I definitely don't think this is the end of gaming in VR. There's way too much potential here. It just might take a while to really see it progress into something even greater. I know it's pretty dry out there for VR fans now, but if Half-Life Alex taught me anything after playing it, it's that good things can come to those who wait. And if I still have this game to revisit whenever I want, I'll always have at least one great reason to put that headset back on. That and having a cool place to watch my own videos. Though that was the last one, and I already finished playing Alex. I guess that's finally time to take all this stuff off. Oh wait, I forgot about porn!